Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. Two years ago, I finally worked up the courage to leave my ex-husband. We've been together for eight years and for most of that time, I convinced myself that things weren't that bad, but they were. It started small. He'd make snide comments about my spending habits or roll his eyes when I talked about my dreams. Then it escalated. He'd yell if dinner wasn't ready on time or if I went out with friends without his permission. Before I knew it, I was walking on eggshells in my own home. The breaking point came when he lost his job and started drinking heavily. That's when physical abuse began. I knew I had to get out but I was so scared. I'd given up my career to support his and I felt trapped. One day, after a particularly bad fight, I called my sister. She helped me pack my bags and leave while he was passed out on the couch. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, but also the most liberating. During the separation process, we had to divide our assets. We owned a house together, but I didn't want it. Too many bad memories. So we agreed that he'd buy me out and take over the payments for the new windows we'd installed three years prior. I kept my car and continued making payments on it. It seemed fair at the time. Fast forward to last week, I got a strange call from my ex. Hey, we need to talk about the window payments. What about them? That's your responsibility now. Well, here is the thing. When I refinanced the house, I found out your name is still on the loan for the windows. I think we should discuss splitting the payments. Excuse me? That wasn't our agreement. You bought me out of that house, remember? The windows are part of the house. Come on, don't be difficult. You were the one who wanted those windows in the first place. That's irrelevant. We both agreed to give them when we were still together. You can't change the terms of our agreement now. I wasn't in the right state of mind when I agreed to buy you out. You're being unfair. Unfair? You agreed to take over the payments. It's not my fault you didn't pay off the windows when you refinanced the house. So you're not even going to discuss this with me? No, I'm not. They are your windows in the house you bought me out of. I am not paying for them. You're being selfish. I can't afford these payments on my own. That's not my problem anymore. You should have thought about that before you agreed to the terms. Fine. Be that way. I'll remember this the next time you need something from me. There won't be a next time. Goodbye. I hung up, my hand shaking. It was just like him to try and manipulate me into feeling guilty. But I wasn't falling for it this time. The next day, I got a series of angry text messages from him. You're really going to leave me hanging like this? After everything we've been through? We've been through a lot, yes. Most of it because of your actions. I am not responsible for your financial decisions anymore. I can't believe you're being so cold. This isn't the woman I married. You're right. I am not the same woman. I've grown stronger and learned to stand up for myself. I'll take you to court over this. Go ahead. We have a legally binding agreement. Good luck explaining to a judge why you didn't follow through on your end. He didn't respond after that. I felt frustrated but mostly relieved. For the first time in years, I felt truly free from his influence. A week later, I received a formal letter from his lawyer demanding that I take responsibility for half of the remaining window payments. I forwarded it to my own lawyer who assured me that our original agreement was solid. Don't worry, he doesn't have a leg to stand on. We respond formally and remind him of the terms he agreed to. Thank you. I just want this to be over. I understand. We'll make sure he knows that any further harassment will be met with legal action. True to her word, my lawyer sent a strongly worded response. We didn't hear from my ex or his lawyer again after that. As I reflect on this experience, I realize how far I've come. Two years ago, I might have given in to his demands just to keep the peace. But now I know my worth and I'm not afraid to stand up for myself. I've rebuilt my life piece by piece, I went back to school, got a job I love, and surrounded myself with supportive friends and family. I'm even starting to date again, though I am taking it slow. The situation with the windows was just another test and I passed it with flying colors. As for my ex, I hope he learns from this experience too, but that's not my responsibility anymore. I am focused on my future and it's looking brighter every day. My mom and I were just doing some back-to-school shopping, nothing out of the ordinary. I'm 12 years old and about to start 7th grade, so we were looking for some new clothes and supplies. I've always been proud of my hair. 
It's long, wavy, and a beautiful chestnut brown. My mom says I got it from my grandma. I take good care of it, brushing it every night and using the special shampoo my mom buys me. It's not like I brag about it or anything, it's just part of who I am. We were in the food court taking a break from shopping. Mom was getting us some pretzels while I waited at a table. That's when I noticed a girl about my age looking at me. She was with her mom, who I later found out was the infamous Karen. The girl walked over to me, smiling shyly. Hi, I really like your hair. It's so pretty. Thank you. That is so nice of you to say. How do you get it so shiny? Oh, I just brush it a lot and use this special shampoo my mom gets me. I was feeling pretty good about the compliment when suddenly I felt a sharp pain in my scalp. Someone had grabbed a fistful of my hair and was yanking hard. How dare you? Who do you think you are showing off your hair to my daughter like that? Ow, stop. What are you doing? You think you're so much better than everyone else, don't you? Rubbing it in my daughter's face that your hair is nicer than hers. I was shocked and confused. I hadn't done anything wrong. The girl looked horrified. Mom, stop. She didn't do anything. Don't defend her. Can't you see she's trying to make you feel bad about yourself? By this point, I was in tears. The pain was awful and I was scared. People were starting to stare, but no one was stepping in to help. Please let go. I'm sorry, I didn't mean anything. You'll be sorry all right. Just then, I heard my mom's voice. She must have seen what was happening from the pretzel stand. Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing to my daughter? Karen finally let go of my hair, but she didn't back down. Your brat was bullying my daughter about her hair. What are you talking about? She was just sitting here. I saw her. She was showing off and making my girl feel bad about herself. My mom looked at me and I shook my head still crying. That's ridiculous. My daughter would never do that. She turned to the girl. Sweetie, did my daughter say anything mean to you? No, I just told her I liked her hair. And she said thank you. That's all. Don't lie to cover for her. My mom's face turned red. I'd never seen her look so mad before. So let me get this straight. You assaulted my child because your daughter gave her a compliment? It wasn't like that. Your daughter was... She didn't get to finish her sentence. My mom's fist connected with her face so fast, I barely saw it happen. Karen stumbled backward and fell, landing hard on her butt. If you touch my daughter again, I'll do more than knock you down. Do you understand me? Karen just sat there, holding her face and looking out of it. Her daughter rushed to her side, looking scared and confused. Come on, honey. We're leaving. She took my hand and led me away from the food court. As we walked, she pulled me into a hug. Are you okay? Did she hurt you? My head hurts where she pulled my hair. I am so sorry that happened to you. That woman is crazy. Are you going to get in trouble for hitting her? Don't worry about that. I'll deal with it if I have to. We finished our shopping quickly after that. As we were leaving the mall, we saw security talking to Karen. She was gesturing wildly and pointing in our direction. Mom just walked faster, guiding me to the car. Once we were inside, she turned to me with a serious look. I want you to know that what happened today wasn't your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. I know, I just don't understand why she got so angry. We made it home without any trouble, and over the next few days I kept expecting something to happen. Maybe the police would show up at our door, or we'd get a call from the mall security. But nothing came. Thankfully, I never saw Karen or her daughter again. My parents who've been the pillars of my life passed away within months of each other last year. Dad went first, a sudden heart attack that left us all reeling, and mom followed soon after, her health declining rapidly without dad by her side. It was a tough time, especially with three kids of my own to look after. Their house, a beautiful place they built from the ground up, held so many memories. While living two hours away with my own family, it just wasn't practical to keep it. So with a heavy heart, I decided to sell. The process was exhausting, sorting through decades of belongings, deciding what to keep, what to sell, what to donate. It took months. Finally, I got the place ready for sale. Had it professionally cleaned, staged it beautifully, and it wasn't long before we had interested buyers. A couple came along, seemed nice enough, they loved the house, made an offer. Everything was going smoothly. The home inspection revealed a few minor issues, which we disclosed fully. They still wanted to proceed. Great, I thought. This will be over soon. Closing day came and went. I breathed a sigh of relief, thinking the ordeal was finally over. Boy, was I wrong. 
Two days after closing, my phone rang. It was my realtor, sounding stressed. Hey, we've got a situation. The new owners are unhappy. What? Why? We went through everything in the inspection. They are complaining about garbage left behind, things not working, the yard being dry. They are even spreading some wild rumors. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I'd spent weeks making sure everything was perfect. I explained this to my realtor who sighed. But they are really making a fuss. They are talking about billing you for, well, everything. I was furious. But I took a deep breath, trying to stay calm. Okay, let me come over and sort this out. It'll take me a couple of hours to get there. Are you sure? You don't have to. No, it's fine. I want to handle this personally. I arranged for a sitter for my kids and made the two-hour drive back to my parents' old house. When I arrived, I was met by the new owner. A couple who looked like they'd just stepped out of uh, keeping up with uh, Jonesy's catalog. A woman, who I will call Karen, started in on me immediately. Finally, do you have any idea what you put us through? I'm sorry, but I'm not sure what you mean. The house was in perfect condition when... Perfect condition? There is garbage everywhere. I looked around confused. Then I realized what she meant. Those are in garbage. Those are extra materials. Hardwood, tiles, light bulbs. They are for repairs and replacements. Well, we don't want them. And what about the rumors we heard? That you'll lift garbage outside for days. I explained about the free items I put out. How my neighbor had cleared everything away days before closing. Karen didn't look convinced. And what about the things that aren't working? Everything that needed attention was in the home inspection report. You signed off on that. Well, we didn't realize. And look at the yard. It's all dried up. I couldn't help but laugh at this point. Ma'am, we're in a semi-desert. It's been over 30 degrees Celsius for weeks. There is not much I can do about that. Karen's husband, who'd been quiet until now, chimed in. We just want the house to be perfect. Is that too much to ask? I took a deep breath, trying to stay patient. Look, I understand you want everything to be just right. How about this? I'll take care of the garbage you're concerned about. I'll remove everything that wasn't explicitly stated in the contract. Karen brightened at this. Really? That would be great. I nodded, hiding my growing irritation. Absolutely. I'll get right on it. I spent the next few hours removing everything they complained about. The extra hard work, the tiles, the light bulbs. I even took the custom paint codes. Good luck matching those perfectly for touch-ups. As I worked, I overheard Karen and her husband talking. Oh, honey, did you see that beautiful barbecue grill? And that gazebo in the backyard is just perfect. I know. We're so lucky those came with the house. I paused, considering. Those weren't explicitly mentioned in the contract either. With a smile that was perhaps a bit too wide, I disconnected the barbecue grill and started dismantling the gazebo. Karen came rushing out. What are you doing? Just as we agreed. I'm removing everything not explicitly stated in the contract. But, but the barbecue and the gazebo. I'm afraid they weren't part of the deal. Don't worry though. I'm sure you'll find suitable replacements. You can do this. Actually, I can. And I am. Enjoy your new home. As I loaded the last of the items into my truck, I couldn't help but feel a twinge of satisfaction. The gazebo has been shading the west-facing patio, protecting it from the brutal afternoon sun. Without it, their backyard would be practically unusable in the summer heat. Karen and her husband watched in disbelief as I drove away, their dream of a perfect move-in ready home crumbling before their eyes. I felt a little guilty, but then I remembered all the baseless accusations, the attempts to bail me for disclosed issues, the complete lack of understanding or empathy. As I made the long drive home, I couldn't help but smile. My parents had always taught me to be kind, but also to stand up for myself. I think they would have approved of how I handled this situation. I've always been driven and efficient. Ever since I was a kid, my parents used to joke that I could finish a week's worth of chores in a single afternoon. That knack for getting things done quickly followed me into my professional life. After college, I dove headfirst into community organizing, passionate about making a real difference in people's lives. My path led me to the small nonprofit focused on housing and food security. The work was challenging but rewarding. I thrived in the field, connecting with community members and building coalitions. My reputation for getting results spread and soon I was taking on more responsibilities. Everything was going smoothly until our organization went through a restructuring. 
Suddenly, I found myself with a new manager. Let's call her Karen. From the start, it was clear she wasn't thrilled about supervising anyone. Least of all, a field organizer like me. Our first meeting was interesting. I did my best to bring her up to speed on my work. So here is where you can find all my reports, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annual. I've set up a system to track my location when I'm in the field, and I'm always available by phone or email if you need to reach me. Wait, what do you mean in the field? Aren't you going to be in the office? Well, no, the nature of my job requires me to be out in the community most of the time. I'll be here for scheduled meetings and to submit reports, of course. Karen frowned, clearly not happy with this arrangement. If you're not in the office where I can see you, how will I know you're working? You could be doing anything you want and I'd never know. I bit my tongue, trying not to take offense at her assumption. Instead, I offered the solution. I understand your concern. How about this? I use a task tracking app. I could set it up to send you an email whenever I complete a task. Would that help? Fine, let's try that. Little what Karen know, what she was getting herself into. You see, I work fast, really fast. It's been both a blessing and a curse throughout my career. In previous jobs, I'd learned to pace myself to avoid making others uncomfortable. But in this role, where every minute counted towards helping vulnerable community members, I let myself work at full speed. For the next three days, Karen's inbox was flooded with notifications. Every time I finished a task, boom, another email. Making phone calls, drafting proposals, meeting with community partners, the notifications just kept coming. By the end of day three, Karen called me into her office. She looked frazzled. About those task notifications. Yes, is there a problem? I think we can stop those now. I can see you're clearly working. I smiled a little. Are you sure? I don't mind keeping them going if it helps you feel more comfortable with my work arrangement. No, no, that won't be necessary. I trust you're doing your job. From that point on, our relationship improved dramatically. Karen began to appreciate my work ethic and efficiency. As we got to know each other better, we discovered we had a lot in common, including our frustrations with some of the higher-ups in the organization. One day, after a particularly challenging meeting with the executive team, Karen pulled me aside. I can't believe they are pushing this new initiative without any consideration for how it'll impact our community partners. I know, it's like they don't even understand the work we do on the ground. Listen, I have an idea. What if we team up? Between your field expertise and my administrative know-how, we could make this work despite their poor planning. And just like that, Karen and I became an unstoppable do. We navigated office politics, stretched our limited resources, and consistently delivered results that made a real difference in people's lives. As time went on, both Karen and I realized we had outgrown our roles in the organization, but we supported each other as we looked for new opportunities. And eventually, we both moved on to better positions elsewhere. Today, years later, Karen and I are still good friends. We often laugh about our rocky start and how her initial skepticism turned into a powerful partnership. It just goes to show that sometimes, the people who challenge us the most can end up being our greatest allies. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.